I think all of us want to be uh, better at evangelism. All of us as Christians want to be better at sharing the gospel. I know that I do. I know uh, even though I, as you know, a profession, I guess, my job, I sit and study God's word for much of the week, and I'm grateful that I have that opportunity. I'm not the best when it comes to sharing the gospel with others. I'm not the best at starting that conversation or having that conversation. I'm not saying I'm the worst, but I'm not the best. I could be better at that. I want to become better at that, as I imagine every sincere Christian wants to do. Uh, If we are sincere in our faith and we recognize, you know, just how valuable our salvation is, then why would we not want to share that with the world around us? I know that days go by and it becomes common to us. We're a Christian. We go to church on Sundays. We go to church on Wednesdays. Maybe we have a daily Bible study that we do. We read our Bibles. You know, we live like Christians every day. We don't face a lot of challenges and it just becomes normal to us. But it shouldn't be normal to us. It should be incredible to us. The salvation that we have, the salvation that we know, the salvation that has been given to us by God. And if it is as incredible as it should be, we're going to want to share that with as many people as we can. Not just the person that fills fills out the the survey on the website and says, I'd like to have a Bible study, but with every person who does not know the gospel is who we should want to share that with. And I'm a human like everybody else. I understand the struggle. I experience that struggle myself. I am not the best at this. And so I thought that we could study conversions from the Bible in an effort to get excited about sharing the gospel in my own mind, if nothing else, in an effort to see how conversions happen or, you know, what party does what and, and what the result is. I thought we would look at some conversions here on Sunday nights for the next couple of weeks. And the Bible is filled with conversions. And I think generally speaking, we know what a conversion is. If we go back to Psalm 19 and verse seven, the psalmist writes, the law of the Lord is perfect. Restoring, New King James Version says, converting the soul. The law of God, there's not a flaw in it. There's nothing wrong with it. It is perfect, and it's the law, the psalmist says, that converts the soul. In Psalm 51 and verse 13, again, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. The psalmist says, then I'm going to teach people about you, God. I'm going to teach people how you are, God, what you do, God, what you are. And when I do that, those sinners will be converted to your ways. They'll be converted to you. They'll leave that sin behind and they will turn to God. The idea that there are people who are currently living in sin and currently separated from God by that sin, but when they hear the words of God, when they learn the ways of God, they will turn away from it and then turn to God. And that's exactly what a conversion is. It's the moment when a person is taught God's word, or as the text has said, taught God's ways, And then they decide to turn away from whatever it is that they've been following instead of God and obediently turn to God. It's the moment when a person stops trusting in whatever it is that they have been trusting in and decide instead to obediently trust in God. And technically speaking, every single Christian has gone through a conversion. All of us have gone through a conversion. Every person who has ever obeyed the gospel and been baptized for the forgiveness of their sin has been converted because you may say, well, I grew up in the church. I wasn't converted. I I was never a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist. I wasn't converted, but you were because you were separated from God by sin. All of us were at some point. Those are the sins that have been washed away. And so if nothing else, we have been converted from the world, converted to God. We've all been turned away from trusting one thing, whatever that was. Maybe it was a different religion. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was our own pride. Maybe it was our love of sin. Maybe it was our own selves. All of us have turned away from something and then turned to God. And that's what conversion is. Jesus gives a little more uh you know, background to this word in Matthew chapter 18, and, and we can see that there is a necessary change that takes place. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, he says to his disciples, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And if we look at that context a little bit, the disciples have just asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which one of us, Jesus, is what they're asking, which one of us is going to have the highest rank in your kingdom? Which one of us is going to be the, the top general or the one that's going to sit at your right hand or, or you know, be in charge of this or in charge of that? Which one of us is going to have the highest position? And his answer to those disciples is, you need to become as humble as little children. You need to become as humble and as innocent as as children, that's the change that you all need to make in your lives if you even want to get into the kingdom of heaven. You need to be converted into a humble and innocent state just as these children are now. And so for the next few Sunday nights, I want to consider several conversions that we can read about in the Bible, that conversion in the sense of, of turning away from one religion or one uh, set of religious beliefs and faithfully and obediently turning to God. And the first I want to look at tonight is the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And so if you have your Bibles tonight, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 8. And let's, let's look at this text a little bit closer. In Acts chapter 8, as you turn there, the church is really still in its infancy. Jesus has died on the cross and risen from the grave. He has ascended into heaven the apostles have replaced Judas, who was the traitor that betrayed Jesus. They have replaced Judas with Matthias with the help of the Lord. They have experienced the day of Pentecost in that upper room. The Holy Spirit came in, that mighty rushing wind. The apostles, Peter's given credit, but the apostles have preached that very first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2 to those crowds of people. And for a while, everything in the church is going great. Thousands upon thousands of people are being baptized. Uh, it talks about the text talks about the church ha having this wonderful measure of unity. They are sharing everything that they have with with anyone who has a need among them. In Acts chapter six and verse seven, the Bible says that the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. At this point in the history of the church, the church is really thriving and thriving to the point that even the Bible says and points out very specifically, many of the priests, the priests of the Jews, many of the priests, even a great many were becoming obedient to the faith. Even the priests are being converted, which should make sense. They should have been waiting for the Messiah. And yet they are also the ones uh, or the religious leaders who put nailed Jesus to the cross. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. He's the first martyr that we read about of the church. He's stoned for preaching the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 8, our text for tonight, Saul, who becomes Paul, is emboldened by the murder of Stephen. And he begins persecuting the church himself. He's persecuting those thousands upon thousands of people who have already been converted. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, Read with me. The text says Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. That's Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. These people that Saul is persecuting, that he's dragging off, that he is imprisoning, have been converted from Judaism to Christianity. But as those newly converted Christians began to scatter now, they took the good news of the gospel with them, and the church continued to grow. Philip himself, the Bible tells us, went to Samaria. He shared the gospel with those Samaritans. Uh, there, the Bible says in chapter 8 and verse 5 that he began proclaiming Christ to them. And that was Philip's strategy. We're going to see him do that again. But when Philip shares the gospel, what Philip does is he proclaims Christ. He shares the gospel by telling them about Christ, by telling them about what Christ has done. They hear that message and they see the miraculous signs that he's able to perform. Those, those miracles prove that this guy, Philip, is not just speaking, but the words that he speaks are the words of God. And those people, those Samaritans that hear that message, 
They are obeying the gospel. In chapter 8 and verse 8, speaking of them, it says, uh, so there was much rejoicing in that city. The Samaritans didn't reject the gospel. They were taught the good news of God's saving grace. They were taught your sins can be washed away. They were taught that Christ is the Messiah, all of the wonderful things we know. And then they obeyed the gospel. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, the text says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized men and women alike. And so we see already the conversion and some of the details surrounding the conversion of the Samaritans. But now skip down to verse 25 of chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse 25, we begin to read about our text for tonight, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. After Philip is done in Samaria, it seems, it's a little difficult to tell, but it seems that he and, and Peter and John begin to travel back to Jerusalem. And as they're traveling back to Jerusalem, an angel speaks to Philip and he leads him ultimately to this Ethiopian. And the first thing I want to notice or us to consider as we, as we look at this tonight is that this Ethiopian who is converted was sincerely trying to obey God. He was very sincerely trying, intending to obey God. Look at verse 26, actually, of, uh, of chapter 8. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. That is a desert road. And so he got up and he went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Here is this man who is a court official, the text says. He doesn't live in Jerusalem, but he lives in Ethiopia, which is hundreds of miles away from where they are and hundreds of miles from Jerusalem. He works for the queen of Ethiopia. The name given to her is Candace. That's not her proper name or her first name. That is her title. That would be the title, like Pharaoh was the title of the leader of the Egyptians. Uh, he works for Candace or he works for the Candace. And he has a very high position. He's in charge of all of her treasure. He is the treasurer of that kingdom. But somehow, at some point, this Ethiopian man, this eunuch who works for the queen of Ethiopia, has been converted. He's been converted to Judaism. He wasn't born an Israelite. He wasn't born a Jew. But he was known, he is what is known as a proselyte. Uh, he's an Ethiopian. The text tells us that. But in trying to obey God, somehow, some way, he begins to worship as a Jew. And, and there were a few more steps that were involved with becoming a proselyte, but that's what he is. And he is so dedicated to serving God and so dedicated uh, to trying to obey God, so sincere in trying to do what God wants, that he has now traveled hundreds of miles to worship God even in Jerusalem to worship God at the temple as would be required under the law of Moses. And even now, as we find him here, he is making his way home on that long journey home. And yet he's still studying from the word of God. Look at verse 27 or 28, excuse me. It says, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah, even on his way home. He can't get enough of God's word and he's reading from his scroll or his text. He is a prime candidate for the gospel. We found someone here who is very sincerely trying to obey God. And for anyone who's willing to change or who anyone who's going to become willing to change their life, they certainly need to be sincere in their desire to obey God. That's what he is. Second, the Ethiopian was not only trying to obey God. But very sincerely, he is trying to understand God's word, very sincerely trying to understand God's will. Look at verse 29. The Bible says, then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. He's reading from the prophet Isaiah. The text tells us that. But he's not just reading or you know, trying to memorize verses. Sometimes that's 
what I find myself doing as I study the Bible, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, it becomes more of an academic exercise for me. You know, I want to get through this book, I want to read it all in one sitting, or I want to make sure I finish this chapter, or I want to memorize this verse, or, or something along those lines. And sometimes I find myself focused on that sort of thing instead of really trying to learn what the Bible means. And sometimes I, I'm intent, as preachers will say, on making sure I can get these words to pass through my lips instead of passing through my heart. And I need to be more focused on my heart at times. But this man isn't doing what I do at times. This man is really trying to understand God's word, sincerely trying to understand God's will. And if you think for a moment about the religious climate of the day, maybe some of what he has already experienced. Again, the church began on the day of Pentecost and it began in the city of Jerusalem. And for the most part, the apostles there have stayed there in Jerusalem. If there were an earthly headquarters, there's not. But if there were, it would be Jerusalem. It is the epicenter of the church as it begins there. Those apostles were commanded to stay there at least for a time. This Ethiopian is worshiping God and as a proselyte, as a, you know, striving to obey the law of Moses, that's how he's worshiping. But he has just come from the city of Jerusalem. And we've already talked about thousands upon thousands of Jewish people have already been converted to Christianity. Jews in Jerusalem would know that. This great persecution has already begun. Many of the priests, a great number of the priests, in fact, have already been converted to Christianity. And so to me, it makes sense that while this man was in town, while he was in Jerusalem, he would have heard something about Jesus, right? He would have heard something about this man, Jesus, maybe being the Messiah. Maybe he heard about this group of people. Maybe they were called Christians. I don't know if they were yet or not. Maybe he heard about this group of people who were willing to die because they said and they believed that they had seen this man, Jesus, even risen from the grave after his death on the cross. And maybe now on this long ride home in his chariot, this Ethiopian is trying to figure all of this out. We know that he's sincere. We know that he wants to be sure that everything that he's doing is what God wants him to do. And so he's reading now from the prophet Isaiah. But as he says, he doesn't understand what the scriptures mean. And so now Philip enters the picture. And the third thing I want to notice is that Philip was trying to obey God. You've got an Ethiopian that's very sincere about obeying God. You've got an Ethiopian that's very sincere about better understanding God's word and God's will. And now we have Philip, who was a Christian, who was willing and even excited to do what God had commanded him to do. Philip knew, he understood, that by God's design, Christians <clears throat> would share the gospel with others. That's how God designed all of this to work. Philip's already been to Samaria. Philip has already experienced and, and seen how the gospel can change people's lives. He has rejoiced with those Christians in that city who have received the good news of God's saving grace. There's no doubt that Philip or, or to Philip that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah and that obedience to God is necessary for salvation. And so when when God tells Philip in verse 29 of chapter eight, go up and join that chariot, that is exactly what Philip does. He doesn't wait at all. He was ready. He was willing to obey God. In fact, we could say that Philip is excited about sharing the gospel with some someone new. In verse 30, the text doesn't tell us that he strolled up to the chariot or, you know, he, he, he looked at it and it was far away and he gave up. The Bible tells us that he ran up and he heard that man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now, God's never going to whisper in your ear and say, I want you to go share the gospel with that person. God's never going to talk to me or you and say that person over there, they're a prime candidate. That house behind the church building or if you take a left down that road and you knock on that door, they're ready for the gospel. Those things are never going to happen. But I need to be willing and I even need to be excited about sharing the gospel with others. And I have found in my life that it is easier at times, instead of doing what Philip did, it's easier at times to make excuses or to be comfortable, not want to become uncomfortable than it is to obey. 
God has commanded me to share the gospel with others. And that's what I need to do. But I've found it easier at times in my life, and I'm, I'm admitting this, I am confessing to you this, this to you tonight. I have found it easier to say, well, that person over there, they don't want to hear it. And that person over there, they're not going to be interested. Or, or they go to that church down the street, and so I'm not even going to bother with them with that right now. That person looks too busy. This man's on a trip. He's traveling home. Who would ever think to find people traveling and stop them and talk to them about the gospel? But that's what Philip has done. He ran and he asked the man, do you understand what you're reading? And look at verse 32. The Bible says, now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. A passage to us very clearly because we are familiar with the Bible. We're students of the Bible very clearly. It's speaking of Jesus. With this man traveling home hundreds of miles, he's confused. Maybe when he was in Jerusalem, he heard someone say, you know, Jesus is the Messiah. And that perked up his his ear, you know, he thought, I, I need to give that some thought. And then maybe he heard someone over here say, well, of course he isn't the Messiah. That man, Jesus, he died on the cross, on a Roman cross of all things. That would never happen to the Messiah. But then he heard someone over here say again, but that's exactly what Isaiah prophesied. And maybe, I don't know, maybe that Ethiopian man, he thought, I'm going to check this out on my way home. I need to figure this out. And so here he is trying to obey God, trying to better understand God's word and God's will. And so he's searching these scriptures. And thankfully, Philip is also very sincere in trying to obey God. Fourth, though, Philip was also very sincerely trying to teach God's will. We've got this man that's trying to obey, a man who is trying to understand. You've got another man coming in who's already a Christian who is, who is striving to obey and striving to teach. Look at verse 34 of chapter 8. The eunuch answered Philip and he said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? He asks the question, is Isaiah writing about Isaiah or is Isaiah writing about someone else? Maybe even someone that is to come. In verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. He answered this man's question and he taught this man the gospel. In verse 36, we learn a little bit more about exactly what he taught. The text says, as they went along the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Nothing in that passage of Scripture from Isaiah, and we may not have uh, certainly all of the text that he was looking at, but nothing from the passage from Isaiah mentioned anything about water or anything about being baptized in water. But clearly, Philip has explained it to this man as he is trying, uh, striving to share the gospel with others. And now this Ethiopian knows and understands what it takes, what it requires to obey God. Verse 37 Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He ordered the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. A couple of of notes that we need to keep in mind. Number one, this man wasn't sprinkled with water. He wasn't uh, poured water on his head. That's not what Philip did. This man didn't wait for a special Sunday at the end of the month or a special Sunday in the quarter or some holiday to be baptized. The text very plainly says that both of them went down into the water, that the Ethiopian was baptized and both of them came up out of that water. And that is the conversion. That is the conversion of this Ethiopian man. And in so many ways, as we look at this familiar passage of Scripture, this is God's design for conversion. This is God's design for the growth of the church. 
You know, the angel spoke to Philip and God spoke to Philip. You know, go and go this direction over here. Go and catch up to that chariot over there. The angel and God never spoke to the Ethiopian and said, here's what you need to, be, need to do to be saved. They left that. God left that in Philip's hands. It's God's design for the church that Christians will share the gospel with others. This does seem to be an ideal Scenario, though, you take a person who, again, is sincerely interested in obeying God and sincerely interested in understanding God's word. And then you add to that a Christian who is sincerely trying to obey God and sincerely trying to teach God's word and and teach God's will to others. And the result of those things combined is a conversion. How could it be anything else, right? Two sincere people trying to do what's right, who know the truth of God's word. Of course, the result is a conversion. So my thought tonight is that if you are not a Christian, perhaps you need to be a little bit more like this Ethiopian man. Ask yourself the question, are you sincerely trying to obey God? Are you honestly and sincerely trying to better understand God's word? Are you sincerely trying to better understand what God has commanded every person to do? If you are a Christian, and as I know most of us are here tonight, two questions I think we need to ask ourselves. And the first is to go to the back of the back to the beginning of this lesson. If you are a Christian, have you truly been converted? That's a question we should all be able to answer very easily. But have you honestly, sincerely walked away from whatever it was that was your focus before, that you trusted in before, and have you turned to God? Is He where you've put your faith now? Have you left those things behind? Have you left the world behind? Have you left sin behind? Are you truly dedicated to God? And if you are, if you have been converted, may I suggest, like myself, that perhaps you need to be a little bit more like Philip. Are you sincerely trying to obey God? Are you sincerely trying to teach God's word, looking for those opportunities, being willing, being even excited to do that? I know tonight that I need to be more like Philip. And I'm sure that many of us here tonight could say the same thing. I hope you can say the same thing. I'll feel terrible if you can't. But I think we're all in that same boat. Tonight, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, we invite you to make that decision. The Bible teaches exactly what we have seen uh, displayed for us tonight in Acts chapter 8, that when a person hears the word of God and they believe it, and when that person is willing to obey it by repenting of sin, turning away from the world, turning away from sin, and turning toward God, that person can do just what this man did. They can confess the name of Jesus, go down into the waters of baptism, and come back up out of those waters, as Romans chapter 6 tells us, to walk in a newness of life. If you haven't done that, do that tonight. Maybe you have been baptized, but as you consider this lesson tonight and these scriptures tonight, you realize that there are things that you need to change in your Christian life. Maybe uh, you're still hanging on to things of the world and you need to let those things go. Maybe you're not as committed to God as you should be. Uh, maybe you have missed opportunities or neglected those opportunities to share the gospel with others. Maybe it's something else completely. Tonight, if you're a Christian, but you have sin in your life that is separating you from God, don't leave this place carrying that burden of sin and separation. Repent of that sin and pray to God to forgive you, and He will. And if you need the prayers of this congregation while we're here tonight gathered together, let us pray with you and let us pray for you. If you have any of those needs or any need at all, we hope that you'll make it known. Come forward while we stand and while we sing this invitation song.